Thank you, Jonathan. What I'm going to do is combine two talks. There was a talk that wasn't talked about, which is the upper and mid face. And so this is the first half is going to be sort of more about what the difference between these two products is, and then beyond that is sort of more specifically advanced techniques of placing it in the periorbital uh, mid face and lower face area. So it's going to be a little bit longer than 15 minutes. We're going to first talk about again, just to reiterate that it's FDA approved for nasolabial folds. Hyaluronic acid principle, essentially hyaluronic acid is a polysaccharide and it's found in, uh, across all species of the same thing. And there is a water binding ca capacity which we're going to talk about more in a second. So there are really two, er two ways it's derived, either through uh, uh, an animal like the coxcomb of a, of a rooster or bacterial biosynthetic which is what Restylane and Juvederm uh, are created. The types, they're really, as I mentioned, the NASHA, which is the non-animal stabilized hyaluronic acid, which are the Restylane, and Juvederm, and Captique. I also believe it's, I hate to say, I hope there's not, they're not sponsoring this, Captique, but it's something that, it, because it's such a high water content, it just literally, there's not much hyaluronic acid in it. It's about a quarter of what's in Restylane. And animal-derived products like Hyaloform and Hyaloform Plus, which I don't use. Um, there's really two components of the hyaluronic acid. There's an uncrosslink and a crosslink component. The uncrosslink component really is just to add uh, the lubrication so it, it, it can work like a, a liquid and, and it can slide through more easily. But it really just lasts a couple days. It's, it's not something that's going to have longevity. When I was teaching this injectable course, I was teaching uh, people with non-crosslinked so that they could practice on one another and it would just be gone in a day. So it's a good way to, to practice if you really want to you know, just have your pharmacy compound it. And then cross-linked hyaluronic acid is something that has the longevity, but it really, if you cross-link everything, it just becomes a solid, like a, like a brick wall, and you can't put it through. So how does this work? Basically, what happens is that Restylane uses a mesh screen that takes these solid cross-linked products and then pushes it through to make these small particles and mixes it with some of the uncrosslink component and then through a specialized hylocross method that Juvederm won't reveal exactly how they do it, they, they um, have a different method of creating these smaller, more liquid particles. And as you, as you heard earlier, perlane, wrestling, each of those things have different degrees of size particles. The bigger the size, the, the deeper it should be placed. The other component of hyaluronic acid you should know about is that it's very hydrophilic. That's why oftentimes the lips swell up a little bit for a few days. And the, if you look at, for example, Captique, it's probably the next one, let me go to the next slide. The Captique is, and Hyaloform have almost an equilibrium. It's like five milligrams of, uh, per cc of, of hyaluronic acid. So it's already in an equilibrium state. So when you inject it in, there's barely any swelling. But at the same time, you don't get much durability because there's so little hyaluronic acid in there. Whereas if you look at Restylane and Juvederm, there's a much higher content of hyaluronic acid to water. So it's got to achieve the stabilization process where water is being drawn in. And that's why you get a little bit swelling for a while as it's equilibrating. This slide is from, uh, the, from Allergan, so there may be some bias, if you will. I, I got some stuff from Restylane, but it wasn't sufficient for me to make any scientific commentary on. So the hyaluronic acid content is a little bit higher in Juvederm with a little bit lower cross-linked percentage. Um, the question is, does that really make a difference in the long-term longevity? I, I will tell you how I use it in my practice and why. Um, we're going to talk principally about off-label discussions of these products. I have really streamlined my inventory now and I principally use Restylane and Perlane. It's not to say they're better products than Juvederm, but there are certain issues. I do a lot of periorbital fills and some of my colleagues who are very experienced injectors have had problems with Juvederm around their eyes in terms of spreading and then long-term edema. I have personally not seen that, but just to streamline my, my, my inventory, I pretty much do Restylane and Perlane, but I still prefer Juvederm for the lips. I think it's a slightly softer product in that area, so I sort of mix the bag a bit, but I generally speaking because I do volume fills. I prefer um, Restylane Perlane, but Juvederm works quite well in my hands. I've just streamlined my, my uh, inventory, if you will. So I'm, as you heard, I pretty much use hyaluronic acids exclusively, and the reason being is I can, I can have that reversibility. I can, I, can have that convert, I can convert them to fat by dissolving the product before I move to fat. And how do I do this? So it's a very volume-centric perspective. Essentially what I do is you heard I typically use four syringes, which would be two of Restylane and two of Perlane. I use much higher volumes than other people. But I don't use 10, 12 syringes. I really target those areas that are maximally important for aesthetic benefit. And what are they? It, actually, in order of importance, the anterior cheek is so critical. People under 
under anticipate what that cheek does just lift your cheek up you'll see your eye looks less tired if you're over you know 35 40 it's it makes sometimes a more profound impact on the way a person looks in terms of looking tired than even periorbital fills so rethink what you know today the if, if you've got a heavier patient the pre jowl is more important and I'm going to do some case studies with you to understand this more so, there we go that little thing I will go up here right here I, I attack the rim I attack the anterior malar depression, the buccal, and the canine fossa all circumferentially. So I, with one stab, I hit everything. And uh, what I do is I'll go in there and I'll hit the rim first with a CC of wrestling. Then I'll come in and go lateral. And here's a trick. What I learned a trick is whenever I'm hitting the anterior cheek where there's that maximal depression, you can fill a zygomatic arch, you can fill everything, but if you just target your effect right on the malar depression, you'll cover up zyg zygomatic arch bone exposure. I'll, I'll explain that through a photo in a moment. Um, and so I'm hitting that area, and if you attack the malar depression in a perpendicular fashion, you're going to break up some of the ligamentous attachments, and you're going to get a smoother fill of that area is what I do with fat. Um, and then the buckle is easy because they're blocked here. If it even goes outside of the buckle range of the cannula, they don't feel it. And you're just putting in literally about a half a cc to a cc of purline per side just to increase a little bit more buckle, soften the transition. So it's, it's, just, it's very, very easy. I can put in seven syringes in two minutes and it really creates a wonderful, wonderful result. Here's our example. And I did do a little bit uh, of Juvederm fill in the lips as well, but no line fills, just uh, about five syringes here. And what you're seeing, do you notice that her brows look heavy on the left, but they don't look so heavy on the right? It's not Botox. Because when you have proportional increase of the, of the, of the cheek structure, the brows look smaller. That's what the effect is. And do you see the exposure of the zygomatic arch right here because of this depression? Once I put it here, your brain doesn't see the bone as much. And so you're taking that discontinuity and, and filling it. By just putting a half a syringe, you can create continuity, visual continuity that you can't see anymore. So this is the trickery that's there and a little pre-jow fill. And here's a lady here that took about six syringes and because I filled her buckle area. And this is when I think the lines do impact on her beauty. So I went and filled the syringe of uh, Restylane, I believe, into her, her, her lines. And here's a lady that has relatively large cheeks. She's, she works with me. And so what I did for her is I filled the upper cheek to blend in the pre-jowl and the chin and then the periorbital so that the cheeks don't stand out as much. And that's just a little bit of blending in the right places. This is my, my nurse, who, the photo was actually taken four years ago when she was 35. And you can actually see that the nasolabial folds, in my opinion, do detract from and make her look older. So I did fill them. And this is wrestling around the eyes, a little purlane in the cheeks and jawline. And then another little bit of, I think I did purlane actually in her nasolabial fold, just to create a little bit more balance. So this is one of those few cases where I do a nasolabial fold fill. And this, as I showed you earlier, is just showing you that the nasolabial fold can deepen sometimes with a, with a cheek fill, and you've got to warn the patient about that. And sometimes I just give them a syringe for free if, if they're bothered by that. And again, you saw that lady as well. It's a, it's a volume fill. That's it. Thank you.